Like the office they commemorate, presidential libraries are living institutions. Certainly it is my hope that the Reagan Library will become a dynamic intellectual forum where scholars interpret the past and policymakers debate the future. Welcome to the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute's virtual event series. To fulfill President Reagan's mission of making the Reagan Library a dynamic intellectual forum, our Center for Public Affairs Programming offers lectures and forums presenting perspectives on important public policy issues of the day. Each year, we bring you 20 to 30 events from politicians, authors, members of the media, business and military leaders, and more. Since the March 2020 closure of many businesses across our great country, the Reagan Foundation is now bringing its events online to ensure that we are still delivering world-class content, even if you can't get to our hilltop to watch it in person. In this week's Center for Public Affairs virtual event, we bring you Gerald Seib, Executive Washington Editor of the Wall Street Journal, who also developed the digital edition of the Washington Bureau that includes his own column and commentaries, a real-time version of the Washington Wire, and other features and columns. He also writes a weekly column called Capital Journal, which brings an insightful, predictive, and original understanding to politics, national affairs, and foreign policy. Gerald Seib joined the National Bureau of the Wall Street Journal as a reporter in 1978 and transferred to the D.C. Bureau in 1980. He covered the Ronald Reagan White House in 1987 and 1988 and won the Aldo Beckman Award for coverage of the White House and the presidency in 1988. Mr. Seib was also part of the team from the Wall Street Journal that won the 2001 Pulitzer Prize in the breaking news category for its coverage of the 9-11 terrorist attacks. On August 25, 2020, Gerald Seib's book, We Should Have Seen It Coming, From Reagan to Trump, A Front Row Seat to a Political Revolution, was published. The book chronicles the rise, climax, and decline of one of the great political movements in American history, the 40-year reign of the conservative movement, from the election of Ronald Reagan to the Republican Party's takeover by Donald Trump. During today's conversation, Gerald Seib discussed his book, which Rahm Emanuel recently called, A Thoughtful Analysis of the Recent Historical Trends That Led Us to Today. We now invite you to enjoy our virtual program coming to you from our Air Force One Pavilion Leadership Academy Oval Office with Gerald Seib and Reagan Foundation and Institute Executive Director, John Highbush. Jerry Seib, uh, thank you. Thank you so much for being with us here uh, at the Reagan Library, of course, virtually, but we could not pass up the chance to talk to you uh, because it's a great book, uh, really. Uh, well done, and congratulations on this, Jerry. Thank you very much. I appreciate that a lot. You know, as uh, someone that uh, started uh, my career in politics in Washington in 1980, I think that's right about the time that uh, you landed there in the, uh, at the Wall Street Journal. Isn't that right? Exactly right. It's the spring of 1980. Uh, we're contemporaries in that sense. I uh, spent my first day on the job. Uh, I ran over to the uh, Capitol and was one of those who got to watch Ronald Reagan raise his hand and take the oath of office for the first time. And a lot of water has gone uh, over the dam since then, Jerry. This book captures just um, captures so much of what happened in, uh, as you say, in your front row seat. Um, and I wonder how did this idea for this book come to you? Has this been a, something you've been thinking about for years and years, or did lightning strike recently and you kind of put the pieces together? Well, Donald Trump struck, to be honest with you. I mean, like a lot of people in Washington, uh, and particularly people like me who tried to chronicle and explain the 2016 campaign, even when it was over, there was this puzzling question, how did this happen? How did the conservative movement, how did the Republicans make the journey from Ronald Reagan to Donald Trump, at least for me, that was the question because that period, those four decades, tracked the arc of my career as a journalist. And what I thought of as Republicans and conservatives in the 1980s was certainly different from what Trump, Donald Trump had showed they were in 2016. So the question was, how did that happen? And I wrote some pieces, I wrote a column every week for the news pages of the journal, and I tried to explain it as much to myself as to readers, frankly. Um, and I decided you had to go way back to explain Donald Trump, that there was an evolution from Ronald Reagan. And I think the modern conservative era began really in 1979 when Ronald Reagan announced he was running for president in 1980 and it was clear the country was ready. 
And it ran up until the time when the Republican Party nominated Donald Trump. And I, I viewed that as kind of the end of what I thought of as Reagan-style conservatism. And what I wanted to know was how did that happen? And what I concluded in the title of the book reflects it is that Donald Trump did not come as a bolt out of the blue. There was an evolutionary process over time and warning signs along the way that there was a kind of a populist national movement at the grassroots that was rising up and Pat Buchanan and Sarah Palin and the Tea Party uh, and certainly Ross Perot is in the 90s were all indicators that something was happening. I think in, in, um, in a way, a lot of us rationalized or marginalized those movements as opposed to uh, trying to understand them fully. But in the end, I think Donald Trump kind of walked through an open door and to me, it was the end of an era. You know, I think, as you know, Jerry, um, revelations like uh, you've said came to you over time. Um, it's not often that there might be a specific incident or moment where you could draw a big red line and say, OK, this is where the Trump age truly began and the Reagan age left off. But you explain in your preface to the book a moment. And I and it, it wasn't a critically important moment. I wonder if you talk about that. Sure, and uh, I give credit to my wife, Barb Roshevitz, for that, because when, when I decided that the, the book was something I wanted to do and that it was a story about a long period of time, and for me, the uh, journey, as I said, from Reagan to Trump, she said, you have to figure out the moment in which you thought it was clear that this transition had happened. And so I spent some time thinking about it, and then I realized, to me at least, the moment, and I happened to just be there on the floor of the convention in 2016, when Ted Cruz gave basically a concession speech. Now, Ted Cruz ran as the heir to Reagan. Ted Cruz talks about Reagan a lot. He has a giant portrait of Ronald Reagan on the, on the wall of his Senate office. And I think he had reason to believe that he was the logical heir to Ronald Reagan in the 2016 campaign. And then he didn't, he didn't make it. You know, He was the last man standing, but Donald Trump won. So as a consequence of having made it to the end of the road, he was given a primetime speech at the convention. And there was a lot of speculation about how he would deal with his situation because there was a lot of tension between Donald Trump and Ted Cruz at that point. Uh, there had been a lot. And so he came out to do the speech and he started talking about his own conservative beliefs and the values of conservatives. And he never, he mentioned Donald Trump once in passing at the beginning and never endorsed him. And as he was speaking, the anger from Trump delegates grew and grew, and they started yelling at him, say his name, endorse him, and he never did. And at one point, and this I think was the point for me, he said essentially, uh, he essentially invited conservatives to not vote for Donald Trump. He said, vote your conscience, do what you think is right. And at that point, booze rained down on him. He had to stop for almost a full minute because he couldn't speak anymore. And to me, that was the moment in which the Reagan era of the Republican Party ended and the Trump era, whatever it is and however long it lasts, began because there was a clean break to me at that point. Hey, let's roll the tape way back. You know, in your mind, um, Jerry, would you say that Pat Buchanan might have been the canary in the coal mine, the maybe the very first in this modern era that has started driving in the direction your book takes? I, I do think. Pat Buchanan was a sign of things to come in a much bigger way than we thought, in a different way than we thought, too. Uh, uh, you know, Bill McInturf, who's a Republican pollster who does polling for us at the Wall Street Journal and NBC News, told me once in 2016, he said, Donald Trump is basically Pat Buchanan with his own airplane. There, there's that much similarity between what Buchanan was saying in the 90s and what Donald Trump was saying in 2016 and has said since. And what I think what Pat Buchanan put his finger on was a kind of a sense that maybe economic globalization uh, wasn't going to work for everybody. Uh, it wasn't going to work for everybody in the Reagan coalition, frankly, because there were some uh, Reagan Democrats who uh, saw free trade over time as a threat to them. I personally think that is a little overblown. I think the evolution of the economy has as much to do with technology as it has to do with free trade. But nonetheless, Pat Buchanan said, basically, uh, free trade is a problem. Immigration is a big problem. Uh, for people who are now in the Republican Party for cultural reasons as much as economic reasons. Um, and I think a the, the misunderstanding of Pat Buchanan was a lot of people thought he was there as a cultural warrior, which he was, but a lot of the controversy about Pat Buchanan in the 90s was over his support for uh, Christian conservatives and social uh, conservative causes. And I think a lot of people missed the resonance of the economic message he was providing. And, you know, I talked to Pat during the course of writing the book, 
And he, his focus was much more on economics, middle class economics, and the need to defend working class Americans uh, from a conservative point of view, as it was on social issues. Nonetheless, in the, in the period, he was basically um, written off to some extent as a culture warrior. Well, I think a lot of people missed the resonance of the economic Buchanan message, but it would come back, it would come back in, with Ross Perot, and it would come back to some extent in the Tea Party Revolution uh, in slightly different forms, but with similar roots. Because I um, you know, run the Reagan Foundation, many, many people will always ask me, you know, compare President Reagan to President Trump. And of course, you couldn't, stylistically, you couldn't find two men any more different. Um, but from the standpoint of policy and the, the general direction, the two, um, Trump has now taken the, the country versus Reagan. I always, it seems to me on any given day, um, Trump will, uh, pulls out the drawer in the Resolute desk and in it, there's the Reagan playbook. And, uh, and it seems to me what he'll do is he'll get to a page, for example, trade or immigration, he rips it out and, you know, shreds it. But there's a lot of chapters in there where you do find him not, and not necessarily crediting Reagan or even referencing Reagan, um, playing right by the Reagan playbook, standard modern day conservative fair, fair right? And that is less taxes, less regulation, uh, pro-business, strong defense, peace through strength and the rest of that, right? So it's not as though, or in your mind, do you think it's a whole, it seems like it's not a wholesale rejection of these, of, of many of the fundamental principles. Some of them really do match, but many of them don't. Oh, it's not a wholesale rejection. And there, it, it's a mix and match kind of a situation. Um, you know, as you say, uh, Donald Trump has been a huge champion of tax cuts. Well, that certainly sounds like uh, Ronald Reagan. He's been a huge champion of deregulation. Ronald Reagan talked about that from the 1950s on. Uh, he's been a big champion of the private sector and business except that he is also willing to hector the private sector to do what he wants, which is not a particularly conservative idea. But some of these things carry forward. And he's certainly been a defender of the religious uh, conservative movement that Ronald Reagan embraced in a big way in, in the 1980 campaign for the first time, and that's continued. So all those things are continuity. What's different is uh, trade, immigration, uh, concern about deficit spending, in America's role in the world, I, I think that Ronald Reagan was a, uh, an activist and an internationalist for the most part. And Donald Trump is not either of those when it comes to foreign policy. So you have a, uh, you have a continuity up to a point, and then there's a giant fork in the road. And it happens that the, to be that the things that Donald Trump emphasized most in running for president in 2016, and then since he's been president, are the areas where he's different from Ronald Reagan, trade, immigration, um, uh, and, and America's role in the world. And it, it just so happens that, you know, I think the Reagan record on fiscal restraint and deficit spending was mixed because I mean, he had a Democrat in Congress that wasn't really going to play a ball on those things. But President Trump's not even trying. So those are the ways I think they're different. And there's significant differences. It's a remaking of the message. There's an interesting point that occurred to me as I, as I wrote the book that I throw in here. It's not a policy point. Um, but I, as different as Donald Trump and Ronald Reagan are, and they are different in many ways that are stark, but there are two ways in which they're similar. They're both former Democrats. And I think that matters in their ability to speak to working class Americans. And they're both, for, they're both former entertainers. They both came to the White House with a background in entertainment. Now, starkly different kinds of entertainment, I will grant you. Movies and reality TV are not the same thing, but they understand the ability of, of mass media messaging. They understand how to grab an audience and know how to keep an audience. And in that respect, there's some similarities there. And those turn out to be good things uh, to have at your disposal when you're running for president and when you're serving as president. Jerry, you referenced a couple times the uh, one big fork in the road is over deficit spending. Um, you live and work in Washington, D.C., how many rocks do you have to turn over to find a single Republican that cares anymore about deficit spending? <laughs> as far as I can tell, every rock in town, or nearly so. It is a remarkable thing. It really is. And, you know, the thing is that uh, Reagan's success in, in handling the deficit was mixed, but he never let people forget it was a problem. He reminded people of it, even when he couldn't move the aircraft carrier the way he wanted to. What's different now is that nobody's even pretending anymore. There's no lip service even with a very few exceptions. Um, and, you know, 
the traditional Republican playbook has been to at least try. Um, and now there's not much of an effort underway at all. Democrats have basically decided that deficit spending is okay by and large because interest rates are so low, there's not much uh, opportunity cost there to borrow, uh, uh, to borrow away. And at a time of crisis, and we're dealing with you know, a coronavirus crisis and, a, and an economic crisis created by the coronavirus crisis, then everybody can rationalize deficit spending. So it's a candy bar the door at this point. And I, uh, I don't know who comes onto the scene and reinstills concern about fiscal discipline and deficit spending. Mitch McConnell, the Senate Majority Leader, tried a little bit with the most recent debate about another coronavirus stimulus package, but that's not moving people right now. And I think that's I think that's a significant change. And I think the consequences aren't clear yet, but I'm convinced there will be consequences. Yeah, me too. Uh, you know, so much for smaller government, but it seems to me, as you know, Jerry, oftentimes the Congress or administration, they don't, you know, America has to react to a crisis, right? And for the deficit to become a crisis, it seems to me it's, there's a debt problem. There's, a, you know, something down the road is going to throw the country into a tailspin, and maybe then it might get reawakened somehow. Um, underneath uh, all this activity happening through these various personalities, uh, through time and politics, you, you you make a really excellent case for it. You call it the three-legged stool, and and others do as well. The dynamics occurring with that three-legged stool. Can you can you walk us through that? Right, and it, this was really in a way not a revelation to me, but I appreciated it a lot more when I went back and looked at the very beginnings of the Reagan Revolution and what he really did in that 1980 campaign. This it was really seminal because he did put together the three-legged stool in a way that it could, it could stay together. You had economic conservatives, you had social conservatives, and you had national security conservatives. So the neocons really in that at that point. And he knit, knit them together in 1980. And they stayed knit together for, I would say, for 20 years after that. And that was the conservative movement and it was the Republican Party. But what One of the things that happened, and I underappreciated at the time, not its significance, but its political impact, was that one of the things that allowed those disparate groups of people who had quite different agendas, uh, different areas of emphasis, uh, different areas of concern, one of the things that, that pulled them together and held them together was, was a significant shared concern about the Soviet Union and communism. You know, social conservatives and national security conservatives and economic conservatives could all agree that communism and the Soviet Union and the communist uh, system were all threats that we had to unite to fight against. And that was certainly true of the conservative movement, was true of the country more widely, but it held that three-legged stool together. It was the binding around the legs. And then it went away. And it went away, you know, in large part because of what Ronald Reagan did. Uh, you know, he set up the, uh, the, the, the Soviet Union to fall into that ash uh, of history he talked about. And then George H.W. Bush kind of finished off the project. Um, and that was a great thing, but it kind of removed the glue that was holding everything together. When that grew dried, dried up and cracked, then I think it was harder for conservatives to sit, figure out why they were all hanging together. Because you know there were a lot of economic conservatives who didn't share the social values of the religious conservatives in the coalition. And there were a lot of national security conservatives, the neocons who had arrived uh, who had a much more ambitious view of what America's role in the world ought to be than some of those social and economic conservatives. And when the glue was gone, then I think the splintering happened. And that's what you saw, I think, in the late 1990s. And certainly that was some of the problem that George W. Bush had um, even after 9-11. Compare for us, uh, Jerry, um, Trump and Ross Perot, because they, as I read your book, it just so per reminded me so well of the fact that, you know, the great sucking sound of all that, they're almost, uh, you know, Siamese twins split at birth in some respects. So talk to us about the precedent that, that uh, Perot set. Well, uh, you know, I spent a fair amount of time in the 90s covering the Perot phenomenon just because I found it fascinating, frankly. And um, when I went back for the book and started reconstructing that period, I thought, wow, this was a early version of Donald Trump, Ross Pro. So first of all, what animated them? Well, uh, in the first case, and people forget this, I sort of forgot, it was, R Ross Pro was initially uh, animated by deficits, but then he forgot about that. And he really decided he was animated by free trade and the perils of free trade, the giant sucking sound of NAFTA. 
uh, very Trump-like impulse. He was um, very uh, dismissive, scornful of the elites in Washington and academia, uh, the pointy-headed liberals of, of their time. Again, um, a Trump-like uh, impulse. He appealed to his followers because he was so irreverent, because he was willing to basically insult people. Again, a very Trumpian kind of thing. He appealed to his followers uh, who loved the idea that he was a billionaire and not, did not make them jealous. It made them think, well, if he can do it, I can do it. He's a plain spoken billionaire, so he's my kind of person. He's the embodiment of the American dream. Again, a Trump-like characteristic. And he had no really close cadre of people around him. He would take, you know, age came, age went, people came, people went. It was all about him. Again, a very Trumpian impulse. And how did he con convey his, his the essence of of the Perot Doctrine. He did it by going on cable TV night after night after night. Again, a very Trumpian kind of uh, action. And so you roll all that up and you see that, that uh, Ross Perot really was an early version of Donald Trump. Why didn't he have the same success? Well, I, I don't think the time was quite right yet. I mean, I don't think those the impulses were quite right. At that point, free trade and NAFTA were very much center of the road, bipartisan uh, consensus items. And Ross Perot was kind of out in the wilderness saying it was a bad thing. Uh, and the establishment in both parties said he's crazy. Well, by the time Donald Trump arrived, same message and the same style, there were fewer people who thought he was crazy. Yeah, yeah somewhat of a man ahead of his times in, in some respects, right? That's what it seems like to me. Um, you know, you have to say deeply flawed. And, it, you know, I wondered sometimes in retrospect, looking back, what if Ross Perot hadn't been so paranoid, hadn't been uh, such an egomaniac, uh, could he have actually started to create the Trump movement before Trump? We'll never know, obviously, but it's possible. Yeah, yeah. Um, Reagan, I want to just ask you a couple of questions about Reagan. You were there, uh, and I don't mean just there for the presidency. You uh, spent a lot of time with him, interviewed him several times. What impressions were you left with after uh, about Ronald Reagan after eight years of watching just about his every move? Well, you know, the, the first impression I had then and still have now was just the fundamental decency. I mean, people would say he's impossible not to like, but I think that's true. I mean, I think it's, it's conveyed. And, you know, people try, people who disagree with him philosophically and ideologically, you know, fervently disagree with his conservative policy, try hard to like, to dislike, try to hate him. They couldn't really do it. A fundamentally decent person. And I think empathy in a president is a valuable thing. And that sort of just came through over and over again. So that was the first that was the first thing that came back to me when I replowed that uh, for the book. The second thing was, and this is really important, and we all knew it at the time, but you were reminded of it, particularly in contrast, frankly, with Donald Trump, is how deeply he knew what he believed. You know, he had a core set of principles and and they were they were solid and they were consistent. And he developed them, you know, over time in the 40s and 50s. And by the time he became the spokesman, I guess, he knew what he believed. And he knew why he believed it. And, and he could tell you why he believed it. And you might disagree, but you couldn't doubt that he understood what he thought, that there was a governing philosophy that he brought to the table and that it was consistent over time. And um, that was certainly true uh, on economic policy. It was also true in the fight against communism, which... Is a much bigger part of uh, what drove him uh, than I think some of us realized until we got into his second term. Um, and then I think that the other thing that struck me, and this didn't occur to me at the time, but when I went back and looked at the period after President Reagan left office, uh, I was struck by the way he stepped aside. You know, he didn't try to continue to lead the conservative movement from afar, he didn't try to uh, hang on. Um, he And there was a, a, a going away, a departing interview that I referenced in the book that uh, a few journalists, including me, had with him in January of 89, just as he was you know, cleaning up the office and getting ready to leave, literally the last couple of days in the office. Uh, and he basically said, you know, um, it, you know, it's time for others to step up here and to, to take over, uh, and it's not going to be my role, and I'm not going to try to cash in on this office. I'm going to go away quietly, essentially, uh, not in quite so many words, but almost. And that was a, you know, that was a classy thing to do, to say the least. It also meant that he was leaving the field clear for others to take his principles and to move them forward. Uh, and I thought 
that's how he lived the rest of his life, really. And it was, again, a, a principle. Uh, and, an, and I thought an admirable one. Yeah, me too. Jerry, in reading your book, as we walked through one presidential race after the next, and, you know, McCain fell and Romney fell, and, they, you know, they, these conventional picks that the, you know, it's the primogenitor of the Republican Party. And as I read it, I, I really, it seemed to me you hit on a point that was important, and that is it, it almost required an outsider like Trump to see the forest from the trees. And would you agree with that? You know, he didn't miss these signs, and, and I think he didn't miss them because he wasn't part of the internal gyrations of the traditional Republican Party. Is that a good way to put it? Yeah, I, I agree with that. It, it, there's actually two ways of looking at that. One is that he saw it for what it was, in, in, which is to say that kind of the populist nationalist a movement that had you know, moved into and then ultimately taken over the Republican Party. He saw it for what it was. He didn't see it as an operation or something different or something to be kind of used to your advantage. He basically was all in on it. And so I think you have to give President Trump credit for seeing something about the country, but all, and also specifically about the Republican Party of 2016, 2017, 2018, that others didn't see or dismissed or wrote off uh, for other reasons. Um, there's, there's a second way of looking at it, and I have a mixed feelings about this, which is um, the door was open for a Donald Trump. If he didn't walk through and take advantage of this, maybe somebody else did that, you know. And, you know, Luke, Luke Gingrich tried a little bit in uh, 2012 to do that, but he, had, he ran out of money, frankly, but he was kind of going down this path already. And, you know, in 2016, uh, you know, there were some others who were sort of moving in this direction. Marco Rubio was trying to create a new conservative message, one that kind of took a little bit of the populist national sentiment into account, but in an evolutionary as opposed to revolutionary way. And he just got drowned out by the, uh, by the Trump megaphone. But I, part of me thinks that, well, uh, Donald Trump is a quirk of history. He happened to be the right guy in the right place at the right time, taking advantage of a landscape he didn't create, but that he took advantage of. And I kind of came down in the end on that uh, feeling that, uh, the time was right for a Donald Trump, and it could have been somebody not with Donald Trump's flaws and uh, and and sort of quirks, uh, but it happened to be Donald Trump because he was there at the right time. But you have to give him credit for understanding that moment. As we said, you you spent private time with President Reagan, and I, of course, you also spent uh, some private time. I'm not sure how much with President Trump, but enough such that you make the point, Jerry, that. Uh, the public persona that we know of Trump through the media is not really necessarily the same as the private Trump, the, the one that you see as an individual. Can you, because I've heard that from others and actually had the chance to spend a few moments with him in the, you know, the second floor and that sort of thing. I just, what's your view on that? Well, it, it is different. You know, there's less bombast. Um, He's not playing the part of Donald Trump. He's different. And there's some certain similarities. His ability to dominate any conversation is true in public or in private. But in private, um, he's a little less uh, assertive. Uh, he's a little more curious than people think. He's, uh, if you're doing an interview with him, he's as likely to ask you a question as he is to answer your question, for example. He seems to listen, and you won't get that sense at all when you see him in, in public. Um, and he's more courteous. Um, and it's, it's easier to engage him. Uh, you know, one of the things that's similar is that there is a, uh, you know, there is a uh, way of uh, looking at Donald Trump when he's speaking publicly in which you think, um, I couldn't diagram this sentence. You know, this is like he bounces from subject to subject to subject to subject. And that's true in private conversation as well, is it's, it's some kind of an active mind that just like, moves around a lot, uh, maybe undisciplined. And you, you get that in private conversation as well. But, you know, he's much more solicitous of the people he's listening to uh, than you would think he is going to be. Um, and he's, uh, as I said, he turns out to actually listen in that setting. And you don't get the sense um, in a public debate that he's listening at all, that he's just moving forward, head down and charging ahead. That's not the sense in private conversation. As you've said, he doesn't hesitate to take, you know, he'll punch down and he'll do it for, at a Republican as easily as he will a Democrat. And... I wonder what you think, Jerry, about the fact that, you know, as you've noted, while 
Trump might have, at the fork in the road, taken wildly, diff wildly different uh, direction uh, on things that were part of Reaganomics and Reagan and Reaganism. Um, I think I maybe caught only one moment where uh, he might have said something uh, negative about Ronald Reagan. I mean, they won't hesitate, McCain, the Bushes, everybody else, but but uh, I don't. You have you seen him criticize our fortieth president uh, out loud? Because I, I haven't, and I wonder, <laughs> you know, what's the meaning of that? It's a good point, and I have not. Uh, and I think he uh, he probably genuinely respects the Reagan legacy. Uh, he actually talks about having met Reagan. You know, there are a couple of pictures, including I put one in the book of him meeting President Reagan, and he uh, he and some of his people want to be seen as the logical heirs, as actual successors to Ronald Reagan, that they picked up the Reagan coalition and carried it forward. And there's some element of truth to that. Uh, he's very willing to criticize the other Republicans who came before him. He's fairly willing to criticize George W. Bush and George W. Bush uh, and John McCain and Mitt Romney, as you noted earlier. They all are fair game, but not Ronald Reagan. And I think that's partly in deference to uh, the Reagan legacy, as I said, partly because he does want to see himself as a, 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 a worthy successor uh, to, to Ronald Reagan. Uh, and I think he probably also understands the extent to which there's reverence for Ronald Reagan all across the Republican Party still, which is not true for all the other Republicans, uh, presidents and nominees who have come since. Uh, they're, uh, they're, they're held in not the same kind of esteem. You know, he's a, uh, he, he's a pragmatist, Donald Trump is in that sense. He's not going to basically criticize somebody who is still held uh, in almost universally high regard in his own party. Um, I, I do think one of the interesting uh, debates about Donald Trump and, and Ronald Reagan is the extent to which Donald Trump really is a, uh, an heir to the Reagan legacy. And you have some Trump supporters, and doing the book, I'm, I talked to him, who would say, well, if, if Ronald Reagan were alive today, he would be pursuing exactly the same policies um, that Donald Trump did. I, that, who knows? You can't prove a negative. I, I personally don't buy that at all. They said it before. I view Reagan, uh, Ronald Reagan, President Reagan, and just Citizen Reagan as somebody who had very strongly held beliefs on a, a few very important fundamental issues that didn't waver. And I just find it hard to believe that he would have changed his views about um, that the virtues of free trade and the economic and social benefits of immigration, for example, as radically as uh, he would have to, to be a latter-day Donald Trump. So I don't buy that, but there are some people who make that argument. Yeah, um, in the modern day, it seems like Trump's evil empire is China. <laughs> in, in the latter days, uh, there was the USSR for, for Reagan, right? It, it's just a very different kind of evil empire to them both, right? Maybe if we could, uh, some, a few questions about contemporary politics, uh, as in one that's right in our face, the upcoming November election. Um, and uh, I wonder what your view is. I don't know if you had the chance to watch Biden's uh, remarks today. And, you know, it seems like universally both sides of the aisle have been saying he needs a sister soldier moment. <laughs> this thing. Did he achieve it today? Or do you think that's coming? Or what's your view on that? It wasn't quite a sister soldier moment, but I do think he said what he needed to say. I think the tactical mistake was not Look, um, nobody who looks at Joe Biden thinks, well, there's a radical that's not That's not going to on the part of the Republicans and the Trump people to try. But what the good man is to make stick is the idea that he's been pulled around by radical socialists. And, um, and that the, the net result of that was violence in the street. Um, and in a way that the Trump administration has tried to make that the metaphor for the whole campaign. This shows you that Joe Biden is not Joe Biden anymore. He's been pulled around by radical forces in the party to the extent where he won't even speak out against violence in the streets. Well, the truth is he has, but not, not in a way that uh, sort of seared into people's minds. So he tried to correct that. Today. It's interesting that if, on the other side, the Democrats have their own metaphor for what this is all about. For them, it's the coronavirus. And it's not just the coronavirus. It's the coronavirus and the catastrophe that has unfolded because of it uh, is a metaphor for the whole Trump presidency, the inability to use the government effectively, the unwillingness to admit errors and problems, um, the uh, lack of willingness to take responsibility. This is the result of Donald Trump's leadership. And it's not just the coronavirus, it's the ultimate illustration of 
what it tells you about uh, what more uh, time under Donald Trump would be like. So each side has its own metaphor right now. The, the Republicans have violence in the streets and the Democrats have coronavirus and they're both saying, that proves my point about the other guy. And it's uh, not exactly positive and uplifting, um, but that's where I think we're gonna be for the next 10 years. Yeah. Jerry, would you, uh, as we look to the November elections, it seems like uh, both sides now are saying things that get pretty close to dangerous when, it, when they, they talk about not accepting the results of the election, regardless of what occurs in this violence in the street. Do you think we're in for a really rough ride here in November where unless one of the other side just blows the other side away, uh, this is going to, it could be catastrophic for democracy. Yeah, I worry a lot about the week after the election, to be honest with you. I mean, there are so many ways in which um, the very election itself could be called into question. There are so many ways in which uh, one side or the other can uh, overreact to whatever the results are. Um, there's so much potential for, um, um, I don't know, I'm trying to think of the right word, but demagoguery, I think, is the right word on both sides about the results of the election. Um, and there's so much anger built up in the country right now that the ability to sort of set it off with a small spark, and this might be a big spark, is huge. And I really worry ab about that. Um, and I don't know who's who's able to stand up and, and stop it if that's, if that's where this uh, heads. Uh, I agree with you, the one outcome that uh, maybe uh, forecloses all those possibilities is a giant win by one side or the other. But I just don't see that coming. I think that this is a, going to be a close election. Uh, people are acting now, as we talk, uh, in shock that it's tightening up. Well, it was always going to tighten up. You know, you, you've seen a lot of these, as I have. They always tighten up because people come home uh, to the, their party of choice. Uh, they flirt around with the other side and then they come home. Not everybody, but a lot. And that there's an inevitable tightening up. So it was going to get tighter particularly in this environment we're in now, in which the country is so polarized and their sentiment about Donald Trump is so polarized and so locked in, it's very much left in the middle. This is always going to be a, uh, a, a locked in electorate with a few people in the middle and a close race in the middle. That's what we're gonna have. So the idea that there'll be some blowout election result that makes the, the debates about election voting and counting in the margins matter uh, or, or makes it irrelevant is not gonna happen. Those things are going to matter. Uh, you know, at the Reagan Foundation, I may be able to keep just my toe in politics uh, on occasion, and we're, I'm a long way from Washington, D.C., where I grew up, but you've now been a resident there for four decades, uh, just about. I've got a lot of people in the business of politics who did stay on and who have stuck it out since the Reagan days, and they often tell me, you know, it's just not fun anymore. It's It's not you know, what it used to be. It, it, tell me, what's your perspective on that, Jerry, given you've covered it all? I, I, I understand that feeling and that, frankly, I share it a lot of times. I mean, you know, one of the reasons uh, you get into politics or you get into covering politics um, is that you are excited by ideas. You're excited about the debate and you're excited about uh, the process by which you want to move forward. And there's not much of that right now. You know, there's... Um, uh, ideas and policies are secondary to emotions. Um, anger is uh, taking over thoughtfulness, eclipsing you know, thoughtfulness. Um, and people are voting not on attitude, but on, uh, or not on, on issues, but on attitudes. And that's all very disheartening. And the, what bothers me a little bit as an observer is the uncertainty about how that fever cycle breaks. How do we break out of this cycle? It's not just partisanship, but anger. And there's, there's certainly partisanship. There's always partisanship. But this is polarization and partisanship overlaid with a lot of anger um, and an unwillingness to listen to others. I, uh, you know, I think a little of that is to be expected in the course of a democracy. But I don't know how we break out of this cycle and who breaks us out of this cycle. Um, you know, in a way, the, the, the Reagan election in 1980. Uh, broke us out of a cycle of almost despair. You know, I uh, my conclusion about this era that we're in right now is that it really began in 1979, the year when people felt the wheels came off the cart. You, know, you had stagflation, you had an energy crisis, you had people waiting in gas lines, you had a Malay speech that left people thinking, well, 
Why are we being blamed for this problem by our president? And then you had the hostage taking crisis in Tehran. And I think that was a, it was a feeling of despair. Things were out of control. And Ronald Reagan actually stepped in and convinced people that he could take control. And, you know, during that year of 1979 and the following year, 1980, I remember, and I'm sure you do, people actually discussing whether the job of the president was too big for one person. Yeah. Well, yeah. Remember, we even had a domestic policy president and a foreign policy president, which is it's laughable now. But it was a serious idea because it seemed that nobody could manage the set of problems that we had. They were that big and that pervasive. Well, and then I, to his credit, and, and, and part of the reason we talk about the Reagan legacy is he came in and he eliminated that thought. He did manage it. And we are in a similar situation now. You have uh, anxiety and anger and polarization, a coronavirus crisis and an economic crisis, and a crisis of race relations and, and violence in the streets. And people are again saying, it feels like the wheels are coming off the cart. Um, who's going to step in and basically take care of the anxiety attacks? Of Americans? I don't, I don't know. It doesn't feel like that's going to happen in this, in this election, but at some point we need some leader to do that for us. You're in a, uh, you, you have a, probably have a unique perspective on this. Um, it's Trump and the media, you know, I, <laughs> there's no love lost between either side. And I think when, Maybe what the straw that broke the camel's back is when, you know, Trump proclaimed the uh, media the enemy of the people. Um, and a lot of people really remember that, I think, in the press. And at the same time, we, uh, organizations have probably never sold more newspapers and had more eyeballs on their websites and all the rest that he's been very, very good for the media business. Uh, how do you see it? Well, you know, I watched this fairly closely, as you'd expect, and um, it's pretty clear to me that candidate Trump decided very early on to use uh, the press as a as a whipping boy, as a kind of a rebound wall, because it resonates with his uh, with his base. And I remember a speech very early on on a Saturday that I was watching on C-SPAN here from my house, and uh, he basically said, "Journalists are the worst, most dishonest people on earth." And I thought, well. <laughs> We haven't done enough yet. <laughs> but that was the that was the that was the uh, argument. That was the meme. That was going to be the so he used it somewhat cynically, and then and then it kind of got carried away. And then people in my business, kind of, in, I, I think cable television in particular, and I talk about this in the book, uh, decided well, you know, it, it was bashing us, but boy, is it interesting to people. And so he he basically dominated the cable news networks for a full year. I mean, there was a day that I remember. Um, when in New Hampshire, when th there were like 15 Republican candidates actually out doing real events, talking to voters and doing things. And Donald Trump was flying in and uh, he, there was a half hour period where uh, there was a lectern set up for him to say whatever he was going to say that day when he landed. And the, the cable news networks were all focused on an empty lectern while they talked about what Donald Trump might say. And all the other Republican candidates were out saying, wait, well, what, wait, we're doing things. What? But that's what happened. And so the, the attacks on the press led to interest in the press, which led to an obsession with Donald Trump. And that's one of the reasons he got elected. Now we're in a period in which basically it's become a completely dysfunctional uh, relationship. And one of the things I worry about in my profession is um, people uh, deciding that, well, because if that's the situation, we will we'll just mount the ramparts and become part of the fight. And I think there's great peril for journalism down that path. You have to remain objective. You have to not rise to the bait. Uh, you have to basically um, stick to your standards even when you think others aren't. And I am not seeing enough of that in journalism right now. And in a way that may be Donald Trump's um, greatest revenge against the press is uh, if, he, if he succeeds in convincing us to uh, lower or um, or diminish our own standards, well, then he's kind of won that battle. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more, Jerry. And I, you know, listen, whether it's this November or a November, a January, four years from now, Donald Trump's going to go away at some point. But but the the media is not. And and I, I worry about the the really terrible lasting effect that this taking sides business uh might have on the public's um, 
acceptance of the media as a neutral player or as just at least a news gatherer, right? It's, it's really worrisome, I think. Uh, um, and, uh, you know, hopefully you stick around for another couple decades to... <laughs> I, I think that um, there's great peril in this moment uh, for a lot of institutions, including journalists. Uh, I think there's great peril for journalism in this moment, and we need to be careful. And one of the things that we should keep in mind is that um, there, is, there are a lot of people, and this is not true of just journalists in Washington, this is true of a lot of people in Washington, but the place is pretty comprehend that 60 million people will vote for Donald Trump. And so they never bothered to try to explain to themselves, much less to the rest of the country, why it is that 60 million people did vote for Donald Trump. Well, that should be a lesson to all of us. Uh, you know, uh, think what you want, but understand that part of your job is to uh, uh, absorb well, the voices of America and then uh, explain those voices of America and, and put them in context. And if you simply dismiss that need, uh, that mission, well, then you're going to, uh, then you're heading into a place where um, you can't be relied upon to explain uh, the, the, the important the developments in the day. I mean, there's some danger in that. Four decades in Washington, D.C., a number of presidencies. You've covered so many stories. You know, you've been, essentially been taken hostage at one point uh, during the late uh, latter years of the Reagan presidency. You've won. I think you've been on a team that won a Pulitzer Prize. You've won just about every major journalistic award. Uh, congratulations on that. I, from, which, from your perspective, Jerry, is there a story or a moment uh, in your mind that uh, made it all worthwhile, you know, where you, know, you really felt, uh, this is it. I, I made the right decision in my life, and, and uh, my career as a journalist is... What it's all about. Does something stand out in that regard? Really interesting question. And I, I think the, um, and this sounds um, tragic, but I think in, in, in many ways the morning of 9 11, um, you know, it was uh, the mo probably the most important single event that has happened in our lifetimes in America, which is to say it's the one thing I can think of that changed everything. I mean, everything changed in that one hour period on that morning. Of and um, I, it was a rare example in which I kind of felt like my career had prepared me for the moment. I was helping around our Washington bureau. Um, and I, I understood the Middle East because I'd been based in the Middle East. And I understood national security because I'd covered national security. I understood uh, the political reaction because I had covered uh, quite extensively the guy who was president at the time, George W. Bush. And it was one of those things where I thought, well, it's important that we all understand this moment. Our job is to explain this moment to an American public that is just not only scared, but absolutely baffled by what has happened. And I, I, look, I have a small little piece of that effort to explain what happened, but it was, it was the moment in which I thought, well, I'm glad I stuck with this and that I was on the path I was on because I feel like in a, a crucial moment, I've at least had the right preparation to help explain it to people who needed to understand it. And, um, that's, I think, that that morning will never leave me. Now, like so many Americans, I understand that. But that moment, the very moment in which the, uh, the second plane struck the second tower uh, was a moment in which uh, I had a feeling I've never had since then, which is that everything is now going to be different. And to be in that moment and feel like you had something to say in that moment, well, that's what you hope for at the beginning. Yeah, sure. Must be a very satisfactory feeling. So, congratulations, uh, Jerry. We uh, a wonderful book, and I, I really admire you for stringing history together as you have to to uh, come up with it. And I, I I really urge anyone who wants to understand uh, the movement in the Republican Party in the last forty years to take a read of this book. It was a great read, and uh, congratulations again, Jerry, for for such a, putting together such a fine piece of work. Thank you very much. And, and, and thanks for what you, you all do out there. It's, you've got a wonderful institution. And, uh, uh, I've, I've been a couple of times, and I uh, look forward to when we can get back because um, I walk out with chills run down my spine every time. Yeah, great. Thanks for being with us, Jared. We hope this conversation has inspired you to share what you've learned with your family and friends and that you'll join us again for an upcoming event. 
And let me offer lesson number one about America. All great change in America begins at the dinner table. So tomorrow night in the kitchen, I hope the talking begins. And children, if your parents haven't been teaching you what it means to be an American, let them know and nail them on it. That would be a very American thing to do.